Sabbath. I hope you all had a wonderful, lovely week and that you have received bountiful love, joy, and peace from our Lord. And I hope you continue to bless each one of us and our families. Last time we studied chapter 13 of Genesis. It was about Abram and Lot who had grown rich in livestock and their herdsmen were fighting over water and pasture. And so they decided to separate from each other. And Lot chose to live close to Sodom because the land was well watered. In another word, the land was fertile. Tonight we'll study chapter 14 and Lot's and Abram's story will continue. Let's read. About this time, war broke out in the region. King Amraphel of Babylonian, King Ariok of Elaser, King Kidoleomer of Elam, and King Tidal of Goyim fought against King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shina of Edma, King Shemabur of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, also called Zoah. These second group of kings joined forces in Sidon Valley, that is the valley of the Dead Sea. For 12 years, they had been subject to King Kedoliamur, but in the 13th year, they rebelled against him. Back in the days of Abram, land was not ruled by big nations but by city-states, raiding, conquering, and making other kings and city-states subservient vassals were all part of the world of the Fertile Crescent in Abram's day. Fertile Crescent, another word for it, is Cradle of Civilization, and I'll show you in this map. It is the gray shaded area, and currently located in Western Asia, and North Africa that spans the modern day countries of Iraq, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, and Palestine. These kings of the cities around the Dead Sea are Sodom, Gomorrah, Bel, Etma, Seboim. They were serving the king of the east, King Kidoliamur, king of Elam, which is Persia, and they had served him for 12 years. But on the 13th year, they decided to form an alliance among themselves and rebel against this King Kidoliamur. They stopped paying tribute to him. So did the King Kidoliamur respond to their rebellion? Let's read on. One year later, Kidoliamur and his allies arrived and defeated the Rephites at Ashtaroth, Kurnim, the Zuzites at Ham, the Emites at Sheva, Kiriathim, and the Horites at Mount Sire, as far as El Paran at the edge of the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, now called Kadesh and conquer all the territory of Amalekites and also the Amorites living in Hazazong Tamer. This action triggered a major military excursion by King of Elam, Kidolamer, or King of Persia, who made a coalition with four other kings, King of Babylonia, King Elaser, King of Goyim, and King Kido Liamer was the head of this coalition. The route was by the way of the Fertile Crescent, which I just show you, headed northwest along the Euphrates River to Haran, remember Haran, and then southward traveling on the King's Highway into the land of Canaan. Their original plan was to attack the five rebellious kings, 
But on the way, they also attack other city states along the king's highway. My question is, why bother to use such major war effort and travel such a long distance? You know, this area was very important to them. Some scholars think that they may have come to take control over the copper mines south and southwest of the Dead Sea. The proto-cyanetic description revealed that the mines were active for centuries, all the way back to Moses' time. You know, in Deuteronomy, Moses told the people about the copper mine before they enter into the promised land. Let me show you. Moses said, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper. Also, archaeologists think that during the 1900 BC, the Edomites smelted copper ore and traded it in exchange for passage through Solomon's territory. So that copper mine has been active for centuries. Copper was the most valuable mineral of that age, equivalent to oil in our days. Back to the story. King Kitalemer didn't just attack the rebellious alliance. All along the way, he attacked the Rephites, the Suzites, the Imites, the Horites, as far as El Paran at the edge of the wilderness. And then he turned back and came to Kadesh and conquered all the territory of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were living in Hassasum Tamer. Wow, he's quite a king. An archaeologist, Nelson Guick, documented the destruction left behind by these kings. Let me show you what he said. I found that every village in their path had been plundered and left in ruins, and the countryside was laid waste. The population had been wiped out or led away into captivity. For hundreds of years thereafter, the entire area was like an abandoned cemetery, hideously unkempt with all its monuments shattered and strewn in pieces on the ground. What a destructive attack. Let's read on. Then the rebel kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Edma, Zeboim, and Bela, also called Zoah, prepared for battle in the valley of the Dead Sea. They fought against King Tidaliamer of Elam, King Tidal of Goyim, King Amraphel of Babylonia, and King Arioch of Eleazar. Four kings against five. As it happened, the valley of the Dead Sea was filled with tar pits. And as the army of kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some fell into the tar pits, while the rest escaped into the mountains. The victorious invaders then plunder Sodom and Gomorrah and headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. Initially, it sounds like the Eastern Alliance is outnumbered. They only have four kings, but the Sodom and Gomorrah, there were five kings. So the Sodom and Gomorrah Alliance should be stronger and they should win, right? No, unfortunately, the Five Kings Alliance underestimated the power of the king, King Kido Liamer, and they lost. They ran for their lives, and some fell into the tar pits around the Dead Sea, and some ran for the mountains. The Dead Sea, located between the countries of Israel and Jordan, is known for having tar pits. So where are they now? There's some interesting facts about them. But first of all, what are tar pits? Tar pits are deposit of tar 
that have accumulated in a crevice within the earth. Tar itself is a very thick liquid. All of you probably have seen it. Nowadays, we use it as a binder in the construction of roads. In Noah's time, according to Genesis 6.14, he used it to caulk the boat. Scholars believe that these tar pits are now within the Dead Sea. But occasionally, chunks of tar will float to the surface of the Dead Sea. But more common sight is pebble, tar pebble, like debris. You can find those near the coastline. There are historical accounts about people encounter with the tar pits. You know, in the 5th century AD, a Christian monk named Sabas went floating on one piece of tar on the Dead Sea for 40 days and 40 nights during a time of fasting. And on his way back home, he fell into a burning tar pit and was terribly burned. So this tar pit really, truly existed. So we don't see any more of these tar pits today because they are within the Dead Sea, as I mentioned. But they were there in the time of Abraham. Verse 10 says in this chapter, said the area was full of tar pits. So the Eastern King and Coalition defeated the Sodom King's alliance. And the five kings fled. Some fell into tar pits and some fled to the mountains. The victorious king, Kitaliamer, and coalition then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. And the story continued. Let's read on. They also captured Lot, Abram's nephew, who lived in Sodom and carried off everything he owned. But one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abram, the Hebrew, who was living near the oak grove belonging to Mamre, the Amorite. Mamre and his relative Ashkol and Aner were Abram's allies. So the five kings, included the ones from Sodom and Gomorrah, were defeated by the four kings from the east. And many of the citizens were captured also, including Abram's nephew Lot. And one of the survivors of the war came to tell Abram what happened. Abram was living near the oak grove that belonged to an Amorite whose name was Memory. Apparently, Memory and his relatives Ashkol and Aner were Abram's allies. They call Abram the Hebrew. You know, we often think Hebrew comes after the nation of Israel is established. But actually, I read that Hebrew is referring to someone who is from afar or an outsider. While Abram was not in his own country, he was not, he did not belong to Canaan. So that's why they call him the Hebrew, the outsider the person from afar. Let's read on. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized 318 trained men who had been born into his household. Then he pursued Kitaliamer's army and he caught up with them at Dan. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. Kitaliamer's army fled but Abram chased them as far as Hoba, north of Damascus. Abram recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and other captives. Abram has his private army, members of his extended family. You know, the earlier chapter said they were born in his house. And the total of these people were 318. They were highly skilled bodyguards for him, his household and his possessions. And these together 
with a trained man of his allies, Memory, and his relative, Ashgol, and Aner. They would prepare and set off in pursuit of these four kings who kidnapped Lot and the others who live in Sodom and Gomorrah, lest they be taken away to the east, to China, or further to Elam. From the passage, look like Abram and his allies attempt were successful. They recover Lot and his possessions and the women and the other captives. Let's read on. After Abram returned from his victory over Kitalamer and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God Most High, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. Melchizedek, king of Salem. There's no explanation of his background. His name means righteous king. And he was a king and priest over ancient Jerusalem. If you remember in the scripture, Old Testament as well as New Testament, he was used as a type of Christ. You can look into Psalms 110, verse 4, and also Hebrew, chapter 7, verse 17 and 21. The king of Salem was well respected, as we can see how Abram revered him. Abram deferred to the king of Salem, Melchizedek, before he answered to the king of Sodom. Also without objection, Abram accepted a blessing from this priest king and even gave him a tithe. Later on, Paul in Hebrews 7 verse 1 and 2 used Melchizedek to symbolize Christ, the priest of God most high. But some people ask whether Melchizedek is the priest of the Canaanite gods, heathen gods. The answer is no. The title of Melchizedek, the priest of God Most High in Hebrew is El Elyon. And in verse 20, Melchizedek blessed God the Most High for defeating Abram's enemy. And the term also used the same word, El Elyon. And God Most High in Hebrew, El Elyon, means Yahweh. In verse 22, when Abram used, when he swear on the name of Yahweh, creator of heaven and earth. So after giving tithe and his respect to king and priest of Salem, Abram now tend to the king of Sodom. Let's read. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give back my people who are captured. But you may keep for yourself all the goods that you have recovered. Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I would not take so much as a single thread or sandal song from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say, I'm the one who made Abram rich. I will accept only what my young warriors have already eaten, and I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies, Enner, Ashkol, and Memory. Abram didn't take any of the loot. If Abram agreed to the request of the king of Sodom to take all the goods from the enemy, he would have allowed the king of Sodom to attribute his wealth to the king's generosity and distort the clear testimony 
of the Lord's blessing on his life. In another word, King of Sodom could say, Abram rich because he gave him all the loot. Instead of saying, yes, Abraham was blessed by his God. To accept such payment would contradict his trust in God. Also, we see here that Abram did not impose his own personal commitment to God on his allies, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre. Abram's allies would be given their own choice whether or not to accept their portion of the captured goods. And as for his own servants, they would be compensated for what they spent on their meals. This story is overlaid with geographical and political details. So what does this tell us about the character of God? In this story, the mysterious priest Melchizedek reminded Abram that God was the one who was in control, and he is the author of all blessings. It didn't matter how strong the coalition was, God carried out his will without problem to help those who love him. Another question, what does it tell us about humanity? We have here an account of the first war from the Bible, which goes along with our human history of conquest and domination. And does it tell us how we should live? Lot tried to squeeze himself into the mold of Sodom and it didn't fit, or at least it shouldn't have. We cannot serve God wholeheartedly and eagerly fulfill our sinful desires at the same time. We also learn from here that our decisions in life bear spiritual consequences. Lot selfishly chose the lush Jordan Valley and got himself in trouble. In this story, he was captured by a gang of marauding kings. Abram trusted God's provision, and he was willing to take second choice, and God blessed him. Next week, we'll study the confirmation of the covenant between God and Abram. Happy Sabbath.